welcome back to the Consummate Athlete Podcast. I'm Molly Herford. I'm the author of the Shred Girls series, a writer, podcaster, journalist in general around all things training and nutrition related, and sometimes I run. And I'm Peter Glassford. I'm a registered kinesiologist and an endurance coach, and you are here on the Consummate Athlete Podcast where we talk about different types of movement, uh, often about endurance sport, and to the people who do those things. And we try and learn from all these different movements and perspectives. Yeah, and today's guest might be one of the most consummate athletes that we've, we've ever had on. Um, I think so, yeah. She definitely has quite the background. Yeah. Before we get into that, Peter, how was your weekend? It was good. Yeah. Lots of, lots of different movement. We, we did a run on Saturday, which uh, I'm still feeling a little bit. My wife here has become fairly proficient at trail running and I have not been running. So I decided that the rainy day on Saturday was going to be the perfect day for us to go for a leisurely trail run. I lost a key and found it. I think I did like the convenient, like, oh, I have lost the key. You carry on without me. Oh, darn. <laughs> Uh, but it's good. Yeah, lots of movement. And then we raced on, or I raced on Sunday, uh, and you were pos- I mean, pleasant enough to hand me a bottle. Mm-hmm. I was going to say, I basically raced on Sunday because my my crew of amazing women up here in Collingwood uh, went out for a 10-mile run with a couple of them, and their idea of a casual 10-mile trail run involves bombing down a ski hill, getting to the bottom, and being like, okay, time to go back up. So... Lots of elevation in my my 10 miles, but super, nice. super fun. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that's that's about it for us. It's been a pretty quiet week. I think things are about to get hectic again. So Yeah, we have a few more Shred Girls type events and different yeah. women's events that you're headed to. We have a Hardwood four-hour event this coming Saturday. That's what, June? June 1st. 1st. And then we're down in New York on the 2nd for... Some Nike racing, and then New Jersey for Nike stuff the weekend after. Um, but the other big event that's happening next weekend is, of course, the Dirty Kanza race. That's right. Yeah, and Wilmington 100K. So it's a mountain bike race, but a lot on gravel. So another endurance event. So mm-hmm. yeah, so I have a lot of clients headed to those two events, and lots of hay is in the barn and preparation done. So yeah, it'll be exciting. Mm-hmm. It'll be. Uh, busy Saturday just watching those tickers and twitters and stuff so, mm-hmm. yeah yeah and today's guest is no stranger to Dirty Kanza or I mean really any other adventure race on the planet at this point I feel like that's right yeah uh, yeah we have the amazing Rebecca Roosh on the podcast so I remember Rebecca from Tim Johnson's ride on Washington about eight or nine years ago uh, she and I were there were only I think three or four women on the whole ride and I got to spend a bunch of time with her and talk to her. And I mean, at that point, she was, as it turns out, kind of just getting into cycling because she was only, what I didn't realize is she's 50. She's done so many amazing adventures, but she really didn't get into cycling until her late 30s. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as she, as she talks about in this, just realized, you know, she might not be the speediest on, say, like a cyclocross course or like a short track course, but if it was going to be 24 hours, she was going to get through it. Yeah. Yeah. I think her story is amazing, right? And she's a firefighter as well. Um, yeah. This is paddling background. Like I say, very consummate athlete, mm-hmm. different Owned sports. Owned a rock climbing gym. Yeah. Yeah. So <laughs> very, very impressive. But yeah, just her work ethic and, you know, just amazing the stuff that she's done over and the years. Say, like she just got back from a thousand mile, thousand bike mile bikepacking trip. And very much ahead of her time, I'd say, because she was doing these adventure races, gravel grinder type things almost before, the, we'll say before they were cool. Like, I think she even mentioned she was into ultra running way back when, like before, right? you know, it was blown up in the US and just this huge thing. She was doing that, you know, 20 odd years ago. So it's really cool hearing from a woman who's been, you know, at the top level of all these different sports for I mean, decades at this point, which is amazing. So if you want to talk, you know, real life shred girls, I think Rebecca certainly qualifies for that. Definitely gets consummate athlete status. Yes. So it's it's a super fun conversation. I think we actually spent a lot of time talking about the mental side of this stuff. Um, Rebecca's got a bunch of really cool core values. Everyone should check out her website, RebeccaRouche.com, because she has a bunch of really amazing stuff on there. And you can kind of see the the 
breadth of her activities that she's done over the years. Yeah, year. we sort of start the podcast talking through her values. She has sort of like a, they're like dichotomies almost, I, 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 sort of. I don't know if dichotomy is the right word, but a couple phrases, a couple words that she sort of talks us through. So if you're, if you're sitting in front of a computer, you can pull up just her web page. I think it's just on the home page. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then she goes through sort of these key values that sort of guide her decisions in life and, you know, which direction she takes athletics. and Yeah, which I thought was really cool because I think that's something that very often gets missed. We set very um, race-oriented or specific goals, but it's pretty rare that someone sits down and comes up with what their value system is for racing slash life and everything around it. So I think it's a really cool practice to even, you know, listen to what she's done and then, you know, kind of take that and think about what your own core values are. Yeah, I think some good advice too. You know, I, I enjoyed, we talked about sort of not retirement, but just sort of tweaking the career, almost pivoting if we're going to use the like entrepreneurial I'm, uh, I'm very yeah. nervous about this section of the podcast. Yeah, I'm yeah it was good though. I think it, it's, you know, if you're sort of looking for like what's next racing wise or athletics wise, I think there's, there's some really good stuff there to sort of ponder at least. I don't know if there's ever easy answers, but there's something you could sort of chew on for a while. Mm-hmm. So yeah, I mean, huge thanks to Rebecca for making time to chat with us. Yeah, I between know. this thousand mile ride and then she's, I think, doing the DK yeah. XL, so 350 miles uh, this coming weekend. So uh, good luck, yeah, Rebecca. So she has some good hay, <laughs> hay in the barn this year, I think, for that. So yeah, best of luck to her. It's a big adventure. Yeah, and yeah, best of luck to everyone racing Dirty Kanza, Wilmington, any races this weekend. Yeah, and hopefully there's something in here to help or motivate you through whatever you're doing this coming weekend. Yeah. All right. Let's dive in. Enjoy the podcast with Rebecca Roosh. When, when someone says to you these days, like, Hey, Rebecca, like what, what do you do? Like if you meet someone at a party that doesn't know you, how are you describing yourself? That's a super good question. Cause I've actually been trying to um, go through the process of writing down like my business mission statement and like who am I? What do I stand for? And yep. um, I mean, it has morphed and changed a lot over decades of being an athlete. And I have said for a long time, I'm a professional athlete and I kind of giggle and I'm like, that's cool, you know. <laughs> um, but now it, it feels like it's morphing more towards, I mean, I am an athlete first and foremost. That's kind of the core of what I do. But I I feel more like I'm an adventurer and an explorer and the way that my riding is morphing and changing um, to, you know, less super hardcore race focused and more expeditions. I feel like it's kind of, you know, my past and my present coming together with adventure racing and climbing and all that stuff um, and navigation is kind of um, matching up with my cycling as like bikepacking and expeditions. Mm -hmm. And I really think that that was from really from blood road and doing the Ho Chi Minh trail and realizing, you know, how much I love to explore on the bike. And, and I've been that way since I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it really does feel like it's a core value of, of being an explorer, but also seeing that one, I want to see those trails, but so do other people, you know? And Mm -hmm. so being able to actually storytell has been, has been kind of a cool evolution of my career being less about me. I mean, it's still about me. Obviously we all want to have fun and selfishly want to go ride our bikes a ton. Um, but there's this whole other layer again, that really started with my book and blood road and doing gold rush tour is that there's such power in giving back and sharing and, and that's super motivating for me right now. So to long-winded to answer your question no, I love it <laughs> I feel like I'm an expedition athlete but I'm also hopefully a motivator and storyteller and and you know nobody signs up to be an inspiration but I do think there's power in sharing my journey and hopefully that encourages other people to get out and do something else Mm -hmm. Uh, and you've done it across so many mediums I mean like you said with the book and the documentary but also I mean with Gold Rush and your private Idaho race and all of that. So which has been your favorite out of the, out of them, if you had to pick? I mean, Blood Road and riding the Ho Chi Minh Trail really was life changing and, Mm -hmm. and, you know, the expedition of my life and, 
combining, you know, my family history and what I love to do to explore and, and also then being able to capture that, you know, I feel so lucky that Red Bull Media House went along with me and being able to capture such a powerful story and get that out into the world. Um, really, I mean, that project, it, it was the culmination of everything important to me. And it's also really launched the second you know, the next phase of my career with the Be Good Foundation and starting to use my bike for, for, you know, more than just me, like I said. So like every ride is my favorite ride. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, But really, that one was life changing. and And it continues to be even, you know, I did the ride four years ago, but I'm still I still get notes every day from veterans or kids who saw the movie or, you know, it's just, It's changed me, but I also think it has reached beyond just the cycling world and just somebody going on a cool bike ride. Mm -hmm. It's funny because you and I met, I think it would be almost 10 years ago now at Tim Johnson's ride on Washington. Yeah. We were both just kind of, I mean, we'll say like pretty much along for that ride. And I feel (laughs) like since then you've, you've just kind of gone so much more in that kind of advocacy and community direction because then you were you were still racing really seriously. Um, and it's just been really cool watching this evolution happen while you're still racing at this ridiculously <laughs> high level. I'm like, you might be one of like the five women I would never want to arm wrestle because I know I would lose. <laughs> and there aren't that many women that I put on that list. <laughs> Thank you. I think that is a huge compliment. <laughs> it definitely is. Um, so I, the first thing I had wanted to ask you that I wrote down in the questions, um, when I was going to your website, just to kind of get a good sense of where you'd been lately and all of the things you were up to is I loved your core values, uh, mm-hmm. that you have kind of across the bottom. So I was wondering if I read them, if you could kind of talk through what each of them means to you and why those and like why those four specific things came to be on your site as this is what I live by. Yeah, and those sort of, it's kind of an equation of of what has worked for me. And I really developed those after Blood Road and, you know, riding the Ho Chi Minh Trail, connecting with my dad and my family and, you know, the history of the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. I kind of came back from that and, you know, went through a bit of a dark period of like, well, what am I going to do with my life now? How do you top, you know, the biggest, most emotional, like, hardest thing I've ever done. Yeah. Um, and I did a lot of soul searching and journaling and meditating after that. And I really had to figure out what I stood for and what it meant and kind of look back in my career to sort of look forward and decide what was next. And so that was quite a par- a process for, for the couple of years following, um, you know, going on film tour. And, and so I really did take a look back and and was able to kind of look at an equation of, of what works for me and the, the things that I've done that have been fulfilling. Um, they all ha- seem to follow this sort of um, trail map, really. Mm-hmm. And, and so I do feel like, you know, even I've designed my website and my logo now has a map and a compass. And, and I really do feel like my dad you know, doing that ride on the Ho Chi Minh Trail that, that he kind of gave me direction. And, mm-hmm. and so that is why the logo is that. The map is actually the place where the tree where he was shot down and um, kind of finding a roadmap because I, d- I have had sort of a circuitous career that sort of may look like I've been wandering around, but I can see now that there has been a um, – there have been similarities in all the big projects I've done and the choices I've made. And that starts first with that risk equals reward. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can look back to like leaving a really amazing job in California, managing and and owning a rock climbing gym, which was a dream job and teaching rock climbing. Um, but I left that and moved into my Bronco. (laughs) Um, and, you know, wanted to travel and do adventure racing. And the only way to actually do that was if I didn't have rent or a mortgage or anything like that. Mm-hmm. It was the only way to afford it was to, you know, cut all expenses and live out of my car. And, and that was one of the first big risks I, I took. Um, and it has paid off and laid the groundwork for, for a career as a professional athlete. I mean, at that time, I didn't 
I didn't think that's where I was going. Um, but you know, one thing people say, Oh, take risk all the time. And for me, it's very calculated. You know, I can't bungee jump. I've tried to do it. I can't do it. I'm not the kind of person who will just leap without looking. And so even, you know, that risk of leaving a really great job and, and going and moving into my car, I had no expenses you know, I didn't owe any money. Um, I I basically had a plan of, Mm -hmm. okay, I'll do this for a year and then I'll, I'll go back and get a regular job. Um, and that, you know, that kept morphing into, into 10, 20, 30 years as an (laughs) athlete. But that initial risk, there was a backup plan. And, you know, another one is when I swam the Grand Canyon in the winter with, with some girlfriends and I was not very much of a water person and I hate cold, but I had a backup plan of, I took the risk to go on this amazing trip with some really qualified people, but I had also planned all the places that I could hike out and basically extricate myself if if I needed to. And so I do like to say, you know, with people, it's very easy to say, oh, take a risk, but it's a calculated risk of like, okay, how am I going to pay for this? What happens if it goes wrong? And I do that in my bike expeditions too. It's like you're planning your navigational tools and I have a backup map and I have a paper map in case all the digital stuff doesn't work. And, and so risk, but calculated risk. And every time I've taken one of those, you know, I can look back at the pattern. There has always been a reward that was not apparent or maybe not was the same thing that I thought I was going to get out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but there has always been a payoff and, so that, that is kind of the first core value um, that is sort of the starting launch point for me. Um, the second one, passion equals payoff, <clears throat> that really kind of is like if you put your heart and soul into it, it kind of doesn't matter if you have all the skills or have all the right preparation or have all the tools. And, and bike racing is a perfect example of when I got involved in 24-hour mountain bike racing, I was a lousy cyclist. It's the worst sport I've ever done, you know, as part of adventure racing, but literally I sucked so bad. And, (laughs) um, but I could go long. And so, you know, my husband now boyfriend at the time was like, you should try this 24 hour racing because one day is short for you. Like I was used to seven day events and, you know, I was, Rebecca, sorry, how old, how old were you when you started 24 hour racing? I was 30, I started bike racing at 38. Wow. So, yeah, I mean. There's still time for me. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I just wanted no, to No, it's context. okay, yeah. but it was, I mean, the, the, the sort of lesson there is that literally I cannot emphasize how bad I was, and I would have to run all the technical <laughs> sections, get off my bike, jump on my bike, you know, ride really fast in the easy sections, but I knew how to go long and take care of myself, and, and I... I had the kind of heart and soul to want to do it. And so there was the payoff. And I mean, there was even an article written about me called Winning Ugly because I was such a bad technical, technically a such <laughs> poor cyclist. And the article was about how she looks terrible on a bike, but she's winning races. And so that's kind of the passion equals payoff that I think a lot of us, we limit ourselves of I'm not ready, I'm not good enough, I don't have the skills, I don't have this, I don't have that. And if you have the heart for it, um, often that will make up for the shortcomings. And it's this passion equals payoff is also part of people will ask me, how have you maintained a, prof- an, a career as a professional athlete like to age 50? I'm 50 now. And how have you had decades and decades of doing this? And it's because I've allowed myself to evolve and change. And when things like, you know, I did Leadville 100 for for eight years and it was amazing. And then I kind of, I did that and I got tired of it. And so I moved on to, to something different. And, you know, now I'm evolving into this expedition bikepacking, you know, long distance riding. And, and so it's for anyone, when you start to get that, you know, feeling of something's not super exciting anymore, then it's, it's time to evolve. And it doesn't mean you won't be a cyclist or you won't be, whatever you are, you just might do it a little differently. And so the passion equals payoff is really important thing that I've tried to listen to that little voice that's like, Ooh, that looks exciting. And, and sort of pivoting and changing when, when the time feels right. And it's a very subtle voice. It's hard to listen to. Uh, But I can look back to all the changes from, 
you know, adventure racing to mountain biking to 24 hour racing to 100 milers to stage racing and now to bike expeditions um, and even gravel. You know, those were all little inklings of like, that looks kind of interesting. I wonder what that's like. Um, and that's just the childlike curiosity that I think is important that we don't outgrow. And it's what keeps cycling really fun is, is that it's not always the same. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I can go back to my running days. I started as a, um, a high school cross country runner and I loved the cross country meets cause they're on grass. The courses were all different. There's something around every corner, but we also had to run track as kind of part of, part of it. And I just kind of loathed going around in on the track in circles, knowing exactly how long each lap should take, exactly how many steps, the cur- arc of the track and the turn, and you're always making left-hand turns. I just I didn't like it always being the same, and so that has been an a, an important core value of of passion equals payoff. The give equals get, which is the third one, and these kind of have gone in order of you know how how I've evolved as an athlete, but the give equal to scat really started with, you know, me loving to share my experience and how powerful it is to teach a young girl to ride or Mm -hmm. to, you know, show people Idaho with Rebecca's private Idaho and let them experience my training ground or, um, you know, just giving back. And I get just excited, you know, watching somebody else finish Rebecca's private Idaho and like, you know, get outside their comfort zone and finish a hundred miles. I get just excited for that as I would finishing myself. And so that that's a big part of where I am now. And with the be good foundation and the work I've done for world bicycle relief and, um, you know, cleaning up bombs along the Ho Chi Minh trail that are still left. And so give equals get. And I think most people realize that if they're a teacher or their parent or they've taught some, their friend to ride how powerful it is to share your experience and your love and see it shine in somebody else's face. It's like, it just, I don't know, it's exponential. And it's, I I do love sharing it. And I've even been that way when I was racing, you know, we'd stand on the start line and everybody's all nervous. And of course you're trying to beat people, but I really tried to like look left and right to the women there and say, have a great day and like, good luck. And I hope you have a safe ride. Cause I, I really do believe that even though we're racing, yeah. um, it's only one person can win. We're all out sharing, you know, sharing the love of being able to move our bodies in a beautiful place and, and ride a bike. And so, you know, give equal scat is a really important one. And then this last, the last sort of value or equation that, um, I'm really working on and I haven't mastered this one yet is that less equals more. And, I do want to give a lot of myself um, and a lot of what I know. And during the Blood Road film tour, I was on film tour for a year and really pouring out my heart and soul, showing that film and that powerful story to other people. And I came home really exhausted because I gave too much of myself. There was nothing left for me. Mm -hmm. Um, And kind of realizing that, and this goes for parents or anybody, that if you don't actually take care of yourself first and, you know, do some quiet time and your own riding, um, that, that you, there comes a point where you can't keep giving. And I, you know, people who run nonprofits experience this where there's, there's a ebb and flow of what you're able to give, but then also you need to return back and, um, make sure you take care of yourself so that, so that you can still be that inspiring person or, you know, give of yourself. And I've, I've had to learn that lesson as my business grows and all these, um, you know, experiences are offered up to me and, you know, and I want to say yes to everything because it's all really cool stuff, um, Mm -hmm. but I can't. And so I've really, you know, since Blood Road also tried to, you know, I've gotten into meditation a little bit more and I've really evaluated why I need to ride and I need to do these long rides often to get away and just spend time with myself and where I live, we don't have cell phone coverage on a lot of our rides. And that's really important for me to just check out, um, whether it's still meditation or moving meditation, walking my dogs, um, just really being disciplined at taking time for myself. And like I said, I have not mastered this yet. (laughs) I'm, I'm a work in progress on it, but 
I have noticed if I do too many things, I do them all, you know, at 50% instead of doing less um, at a higher quality. Yes. And yeah. with most of the things that you do, you can't really afford to do them at 50%, right? No, it, 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 I suffer more. You know, Iditarod is one good example. I went and did Iditarod this winter and I physically wasn't in the kind of shape I should have been for that kind of a gnarly expedition. And I really had a hard time and I suffered more than I should have. And it was a lesson like, okay, you're paying for this. And I pulled it off and I finished and survived with all my fingers and toes, but it just, it wasn't as fun as it could have been because I wasn't prepared. It's, it's like going into a job interview or a concert or a presentation where you aren't prepared. You can pull it off sometimes, but it's just not that much fun. (laughs) Uh, and it's it's funny because, I mean, you've had the nickname Queen of Pain for a very long time. And it feels like maybe you're, you're kind of almost realizing, like, you need to move slightly away from that. Or are you still just, yep, this is this is me? Well, I feel like pain, it, you know, yes, Queen of Pain. And I do, you know, I just did a thousand mile ride around Arkansas, which was physically very hard. And the Ho Chi Minh Trail was physically very hard. I feel like with me, there is something about um, physical work and stripping away kind of the exterior layers that we all put up, uh, you know, our protective shield around ourselves. And for me, these really long ultra endurance things, I, you know, yes, there's pain involved. Um, but I feel like it's this process that allows me to be more vulnerable and open up emotionally, um, by having the, the sort of physical work and, it's not a new theory. I mean, you look at a vision quest, you know, with native Americans, or you look at the sort of, um, the Buddhist religion of, you know, fasting and, or, or going out, you know, there's Japanese go on a long walk. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of things in our history where people are kind of going out and having physical pain or deprivation or work, um, that allows you to access another part of your mind and your soul. And, you know, it is sort of, I guess, a spiritual process. And so while I don't, I don't love being in pain, um, (laughs) but the process of it, I actually think is a, is very much a learning tool for me. Um, And and the things, I mean, we can all look at our world, the things that are really easy aren't as rewarding. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's just, that's just a matter of fact. I mean, it's fun to be really expert and do something and knock it out of the park. But really, if you think about the, the, the sort of highlights of your life or the things that you did, you know, it's always the hard stuff that we talk about, even a ride, like it was gnarly and it was raining. Everybody at the end is like, oh yeah, that was amazing. And we got through it. And so it does feel like the harder something is, the bigger the value is going to be at the end because you really do have to step up to who are you as a person and how are you going to deal with this and how are you going to get through it? Did you always accept, like it, it sounds like you have an acceptance or like an embracing of the pain and discomfort that is endurance sport. Like, have you always sort of had that or did do you think like, I mean, obviously the early exposure with cross country running would be a a harsh sort of start with that. Um, but do you think you've built that over time or do you think you, you had that sort of acceptance all along? I think, I think people are, are kind of born with that. You know, you look at people who are high altitude mountaineers or, you know, ultra endurance cyclists. Um, I think that is something probably that was born in me. Um, because as a kid, I, you know, I would, I would stay out until way past dark. I'd camp in the backyard, you know, even though it was really cold. And so I do think that that was something that's been in me for a long time. And yeah, cross country running as a high school kid, you know, that's painful. And it was, the races were two miles, but it, it felt like an eternity, you know? Mm -hmm. And there were people that were like, how can you run cross country? Like, why don't you do the quarter, you know, quarter miles, And I wasn't, one, I wasn't any good at the short distance stuff. I I realized really early on that the longer something was, the the better I was at it skill-wise. But I also really liked the exploration of, like, what is around that next corner and what is over that next hill. So I think I was born with that kind of a spirit. But I also, it has obviously been developed with 
big wall rock climbing, you know, like sleeping on portal edges on a wall and doing a lot of physical work. Um, there is a reward for me of like just something that's really hard and you, you work and you work and you work and you got through it. Is there anything that you say, you know, when it starts getting hard, you're at mile 200 of a DK XL, you know, 360 miles or however long, and you're, you know, really tired and it's really hard. Is, do you use like phrases or mantras? Like, is there anything that you, you sort of use yeah. or have found that works? Well, early on, I, I learned about that in high school running. You know, one of the coaches were at the, going to the state meet, and I had dropped out. The only race I've ever dropped out of in my life at the regionals um, just because I wasn't doing well. And I stepped off the course, and, you know, um, I was really ashamed of, you know, for my team, to my mom, to my coach, that I quit. It's the, it's kind of the only thing I've quit in my whole life. And Isn't it funny that that like sticks in your head? Oh. That was, I mean, how many decades ago and you're still just like, Oh, I remember it because I was so embarrassed there mm-hmm. and I felt ashamed and, and everyone was like, are you okay? What happened? And I quit just because I wasn't winning and I wasn't doing well. And I was the lead runner on the team and I was back, you know, with women that I normally shouldn't have was not used to being in the back of the pack And so I quit. And that was a really powerful experience for me. And so, you know, the coach kind of taught me a mantra and was like, okay, here's what you're going to say all of the state meet. And luckily, the other girls stepped up and we still qualified for state without me. Um, And I was able to go and he just said, okay, I want you to just ignore all these negative thoughts in your head. And I just want you to chant, I can, I will, I won't be denied. And I'd never, I'm like, okay, I'll just do that. This seems weird, but okay. (laughs) All the other voices in my head were just like, you suck, you're terrible, you're a quitter, everyone hates you. Um, And I, instead, he said, there'll be no space in your head if you just keep saying this. Um, There'll be no space for the negative thoughts. And I did it and it worked. And, you know, I got all state placing and our team won the state championships. And so that those two things, the quitting and then the positive self-talk that I learned in high school were, you know, I remember that and I still practice that. And one of the things, you know, that, that I say to myself in these long, in these long endurance events is that, you know, no matter how good or bad you feel, it's not going to last. And so I use that when I'm feeling really great. I'm like, I could go forever. I'm still like conservative, like, okay, make sure you eat, you drink, don't get too excited. Um, but then also if I'm, if I'm in a hole, it's like, okay, this isn't going to last. You can pull yourself out of it. And because it happens time and time again, I also tell myself if it's really hard for me, it's really hard for everybody else too. And so mm-hmm. like if it's raining or nighttime, I'm like, okay, this is where everybody is really suffering. And that I use that a lot in 24 hour racing because a lot of people would slow down at night. And so I'd be like, okay, I'm going to try to go faster when it's harder um, or not slow down. And the other thing about the positive self-talk that I really have to try all the time is is not talking down to myself and saying, oh, you suck or you're terrible or you're a bad mountain biker. Or, Why can't you do this better? Or, um, I try to imagine if I was riding with a friend and what would I say to that friend? And I would never say the things that I often will say to myself. Like, would you say to your friend, you suck, you're terrible, you should find another sport. What are you doing? Like, why are you going so slowly? And so I try to get out of myself and talk to myself sort of in the third person, like, come on, Rebecca, no, you can do this. And and I imagine I'm talking to someone else, a friend, instead of beating up on myself. Mm-hmm. So those are two sort of two pretty powerful tricks that I try to use. And I haven't mastered them. I have to keep those negative thoughts keep coming in. But, you know, I learned them in high school. And, and yeah, I still use them today. That's awesome. Yeah, I love that, that sort of thought swapping is a great sort of you got to deal with the negative and it's going to be there no matter how who you are right yeah and what would you say to your best friend or what would you even say to a stranger on the trail you would never use the words that you use to yourself and so it's kind of like trying to love yourself and be positive (laughs) to yourself and you know which we we don't often do we're we're hardest we're our harshest critics and that's yeah that's sad (laughs) <laughs> um, I, I've stolen a phrase from you that you used on a, another podcast, which I'll link to as well. Um, 
but it was before the DKXL or, or just after, and you had been interviewed and you said something to the effect, like you're never as prepared as you want to be for, you know, these giant races, right? Like you're not riding <laughs> 360 miles every day and you're not like, yeah. it's not your every day. Right. And, and you said something to the effect and, and you sort of alluded to that with, um, with the, sorry, I'm blanking. I did her out. I did her out. Thank you. I wanted to say La, yes. La, La Ruta, but, <laughs> Um, and I think that's common, right? Especially for people who are sort of working nine to fives and parents, you know, they're not, you know, they're doing Leadville or something and they're doing good training, but they're not doing a hundred mile mountain bike race at altitude every day. Right. And so I, I've stolen that phrase and that sort of reference to give to people, but I'm wondering if you could just even speak to that as sort of just a, a commonality in these giant races and how you sort of come to terms with that. I think it's a commonality in everybody's life like you said we all wish we had more training time or more time to prepare for that speech or or whatever but we just don't and so um I think it's important not to limit yourself and I I kind of think about controlling the controllables and so you know it's a week out from dirty Kansas 350 or whatever or I did a rod and it's like well I wish I'd done more training, but I can control my equipment. I can control the navigation. I can make sure all that other stuff is hopefully dialed, um, you know, to, to kind of help me get through it. And I think another big, big part of it is experience. And that's one of the benefits of being an older athlete and more mature is I know I've gotten through difficult situations before. And I know that attitude and like I said, passion equals payoff, sometimes just the grit and determination will get you through more than the the perfect physical preparation. And I've beaten plenty of people who on paper are way better than than I am with the watts they're pushing out, the training they're doing, but they didn't have the mindset, um, you know, and they didn't have the experience to go, okay, I can get through this. Okay, my derailleur's broken. Okay, what do I do? Okay, I'm super tired, but let's just keep going slowly. And it's almost like the tortoise and the hare, story of really if you just keep going often often that's enough and often that is a winning race or event or completing something is really just keeping going and staying in the game and I think that's why I would you know queen of pain might be my nickname but it's more queen of perseverance perseverance and on paper you know I have breathing issues you know I don't churn out the most amazing watts. I'm 50 years old, you know, whatever you want to put on paper. Um, but often those things don't matter. It's, it's, I think the next evolution in sports and training is what's between your ears and, and what your brain can do. And I've done some really interesting brain training, um, work with, with Red Bull, uh, high performance and some neurologists and brain scientists. And it's, you know, it's the science that we have not, we've, we understand, you know, nutrition and, you know, periodization and the way to actually train your legs and your lungs, what we don't yet understand the next big thing to, you know, unlock is how to train your mind. And that's where, when you ask the, the original question of, you know, were you born with this ability to go long and suffer? And I do think some people just have a different brain chemistry and a different, way like like ultra high alp high high alpine mountaineers you know they have a different mindset than than somebody you know who's bouldering or rock climbing in a gym perhaps not that one is better than the other but but there is something different in ultra endurance athletes heads um and so you know for people who are like i'm not prepared i'm not this i'm not that the power of the mind and just the desire and passion if you want something um often that will Often that can override, you know, the lack of watts or training or whatever else in your legs. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so this is this is kind of almost more practical, and I'm going to kind of get slightly off this topic, kind of coming back to almost the Iditarod. When you get signed up to do something that's kind of completely out of your wheelhouse, I'm mm-hmm. so curious, what does the prep look like? I, what kind of research are you doing? And yeah, like, how do you prepare for an adventure that's just something completely different? What I do, and I did this in Swimming the Grand Canyon, and then, you know, I I would compare those two, Swimming the Grand Canyon, um, and then also doing the Iditarod Trail Invitational, because they were both totally out of my wheelhouse. I was physically really scared for my safety, Mm -hmm. um, because you're going into elements, water, and also, you know, 
the Alaskan wilderness in the winter, going into elements that really are very severe. The, the consequence is, you know, injury or death. And there's very few events that I've felt scared for my personal safety. I mean, Leadville, yes, it's hard. And maybe you go two minutes faster or two minutes slower, or maybe you crash. But, you know, those are hard in a different way. But these big expeditions, especially like Iditarod, the consequence for messing up is, you know, losing toes or fingers or, you know, being alone out in the wilderness. And so the way that I prepare for, prepared for that and the same with um, swimming the Grand Canyon is I reached out to experts who have spent time in that environment. So I called up Colin O'Brady, who's a polar explorer, um, and just was like, okay, what do you eat? What do you wear? What do you do? Do you take electric socks? Do you? And I spent hours on the phone with him, with Ed Vesters, who is also a high alpine um, mountaineer. He's climbed Everest a million times. Not a million, but many <laughs> times. Um, and then also Jay Peterberry, who is, um, has done the Iditarod, Iditarod Trail Invitational 11 or 12 times. And so I called up, you know, experts in the field and I just asked them every single question. I took pages and pages of notes, um, to really basically learn, learn from their years and years of experience in these hyper cold environments. And I just wrote down everything and I did everything they said. Um, and so it was a fast track of learning and it was amazing that they were willing to share all of their trial by error and this will work, that won't work. Make sure you get that little tiny, you know, nut for the stem on your bike so that you can, you can take it off with your gloves on and, tiny things that seem small, but are significant when you're in an environment at minus 25 degrees, you know, you need your water needs to not freeze, you need to be able to take care of your bike with your gloves on, you know, you need to not expose yourself to the elements. And so I really did lean on some amazing world class athletes. And it was really cool that they were willing to spend so much time with me and, um, and help me. Okay, first of all, did you end up with electric socks? No, I did not. <laughs> and I thought, I, okay, I'm going to need battery operated socks. I'm going to need this and that. And I didn't take them. I bought some, I tried them. They weren't working. Batteries are heavy. And so, you know, I used things like plastic baggies, you know, a simple, you know, it's not technology, but like turkey basting plastic bags as vapor barrier liners and, um, you know, various layers of wool socks and extra insoles in the shoes and seam sealing the boots so that no water could get in. Those were all, those were all tips from Jay Peterberry that, that, you know, worked better than the technology. And the, that's from years of him trial and error. It's funny. I remember I actually interviewed you for an article on bicycling that was like, what do you always carry in your pocket? Or like, what's one weird thing? And I think you told me a uh, like clear shower cap because you oh, can yeah. put it over your helmet and keep your head warm if, if the situation got dire. And I always remember that. Well, I just, this last ride I did in Arkansas, the thousand mile ride, Arkansas high country route. Um, I went and did a self-supported ride of that. Um, just got back a few days ago and I, I use, I had shower caps, surgical gloves and baggies for my feet. And, um, the weather was, was, insanely cold it was 45 degrees and raining for for four days Ugh. and I wore those bags on my feet and the surgical gloves under my gloves and they I mean they saved me um so plastic is a very light um a light good safety uh sort of measure to always have you know if you're going out alone so just but on just, specifics did you have in, in <laughs> either case did you put the baggie like over your sock or under your sock and then and what brand of baggy <laughs> and, and then in Iditarod did you use like any other like sort of vapor barrier through your body like or core so the sort of the general you know just riding not in Iditarod but um the the surgical gloves go next to skin um and then your cycling gloves over them um and then for uh you know, for, for my feet, I usually put the baggies over my socks. Um, but you could do it either way, either next to skin. Um, it was just quicker for me to throw the baggies on. And of course your socks are going to be soaked and wet underneath the baggies, but it was raining anyway. So if I had put the socks, 
outside the baggies to try to keep them dry, it wouldn't have made a difference. So in rain situations, I just put the baggies over the socks and then put my cycling shoe right on. In Alaska, where, um, you know, if you sweat, you die or you lose digits. Um, it's, it's a really, the layering system is really important because you don't want moisture to get, um, into the liner of your big, you know, sort of your big cycling boot, um, because it'll never dry out. And so in that case, the, the vapor barrier goes, you know, a thin liner, then the plastic vapor barrier, then the warm woolies, then the warm other stuff, um, and, and that the point of that is to keep those outer thicker layers dry so that any sweat on your feet is just stays inside the baggie. <laughs> I'm like trying uh, to imagine pedaling, wearing all of this stuff. <laughs> it's crazy. I mean, it is really cool. I wore these really cool boots, 45 North. They're kind of like a mountaineering boot, but they have a cleat on the bottom and, you know, they're super warm. And then I had down, like big down over booties that I could zip over those and yeah, you're you're riding a bit like a Michelin man. It's it's definitely quite a different style. Um, but to be able to take your bike along the Iditarod Trail and to be able to be there, it I mean it it's crazy and fascinating and so cool. Um, and I felt like my equipment worked really well. Um, the part where I feel like I could do a lot better was in my eating, my drinking, and and my fitness to be there. So I'll definitely be going back, um, more prepared, but I survived it. My goal was to finish it and survive it with all my fingers and toes. And thanks to all, you know, all the people that I talked to and got experience, got information from, I did that. (laughs) That's awesome. I, I like the, the talking to people who've done it before. And I think, you know, you can do that on a, a lower level. If you're like a, you know, casual cyclist getting ready for, you know, Leadville or something, there are tons of people who've done Leadville. There's tons of videos and podcasts and like all of this information is out there. And I think you're right. Like the more information you have and like tips and tricks from other people, the easier it is to kind of put it into context and be like, okay, I can do this. Well, it's totally, it's totally, it's the give equals get. And if somebody, you know, is like, oh, hey, I've done that. I can, I can tell you what Leadville's like, or, or, Hey, come on a bike ride with me. I'll teach you how to shift. You know, it's, it's as simple as somebody just giving you a little nudge or somebody who's gone there before, who's willing to share information. And it happens on all levels, you know, the, the, you know, world-class athlete level, but also down to like teaching your neighbor how to ride a bike or encouraging them to sign up for, you know, a 50 mile gravel ride or, or whatever it is. Um, there is power in just a little bit of knowledge and a little bit of like, no, you can do this. Here's a few tips. Um, and so I hope, I mean, I know people are doing that all around the world with their friends and, and it happens on all levels, which is really cool. And it's awesome. Yeah. I think that goes in line with like being coachable too. And and someone at your level, being coachable, so to speak, is is amazing, right? And I think a testament that you're open to learning and progressing and evolving, as you say. Oh, man, I'm always open to I mean, I think it's sort of the, the power of pessimism, you know, and some of the best athletes I know, are super humble, they know they always have stuff to learn, you know, they don't think that they're the rad is best thing, you know, they're confident in their abilities, but they're always like, Oh, I could I could always be doing better. I could always be working harder. And there's always somebody who knows something more than I do. And I think that is really the key is, is being open to continually learn for the rest of your life, you know, and have a beginner's mind and try different things and, and ask for help. And I think as you get more established in your career or your sport or whatever, um, but fewer people are willing to say, well, how did you do that? You know, you, you, you're trying, you're supposed to be the pro or you're supposed to know everything. And I think there's a lot of power in, in thinking basically that you don't know everything and you still have stuff to learn at at any age. Yeah. Yeah. I just heard the other day at 35, most people sort of just have developed enough, I guess, quote unquote expertise that's sort of specific to career. But like, even in cycling, I think that we think, you know, we just sort of stay in that lane and don't adapt. And it's a very active fight to, to to fight that, right? To keep evolving and try new things. If this is your way of saying you want to go back for a master's, I 
we're we're ending this right now. <laughs> that is something. I mean, Rebecca's talk about the passion and payoff. I've already made lots of notes on. Oh, and my own cycling journey is evolving. So thank you very much for that. Awesome. <laughs> um, specific to us, sort of pulling information from you. I know we have a lot of listeners who are fat bike. Uh, advocates and then also sort of dirty cans and gravel advocates so I have two very specific gear questions yeah uh, on your fat biking in general not necessarily like just I did a rod but fat biking's cold in general so what is your water strategy in general um, and then also eating like you know that seems to be a common thing is like oh I went into this fat bike race or you know expedition and just didn't drink or eat because it was so cold it's that's the that was the hardest thing and the biggest thing I failed on at I did rod trail invitational is I didn't eat and drink well and it's really challenging. Um, you know it's pretty common that you wear your hydration pack um, underneath all your layers so it's basically you know a thin wool base layer is what I wore and then a hydration pack underneath everything else um, and the tube needs to stay stuffed inside. And you've got to blow back into the tube. Um, so that's pretty normal. The challenge of that is that to take a drink, you've got to unzip, you know, all your layers, reach down in, find the tube, take a drink. And it it just takes more effort and it takes more discipline to drink your water. Um, so that is one strategy that was worked okay for me in Iditarod. Um, but I did find I, I just really wasn't reaching for for that hydration too very often. Whereas normally on a bike ride, I really like hydration packs because I'll reach for that more easily than I'll reach for a water bottle, especially if it's technical, but in, in cold weather, that's sort of the opposite. So you, you know, I really did have to schedule. I'm going to stop. I'm going to unzip. I'm going to drink. I'm going to put a bite of food in because you can't do all these things while you're moving often. And it's very hard for a racer or cyclist to stop. You're like, no, 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 I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep going. Uh, but often in these snow races, um, just all the gear you have on, you can't get to it. And so the other strategy that I did, um, and this was recommended by Jay Peterberry, um, is I took a thermos to I did a rod, which seems kind of crazy. It's very heavy. Um, but I had a, a thermos that when I hit the cabins or any place that had warm water, I would fill that up and put goo recovery drink in it, um, or something warm, um, that had some calories as well. I put roctane in that as, as well. So it was a warm drink that also had some calories in it. And I found that worked really well for me, um, to just stop and drink from the thermos where I'm getting warmth and calories and it, and it didn't freeze. And then the other, other thing I was doing was using insulated water bottles, um, also to, uh, that I would fill up with warm water. You turn the water bottle upside down um, so that the the valve and the mouthpiece doesn't, the water doesn't freeze as quickly there. Um, and then I use um, the Revelate Designs has a little sort of mountain feed bag thing that goes um, right between your handlebar and your stem. It's like a little bag. It looks like a, sort of a little horse trough bag. Um, and I put the water bottle upside down in there. Um, it's easy to reach and I'll drink that first before it freezes. Then I'll drink the thermos. Then I'll drink the camelback. I mean, if you're doing short fat bike racing though, um, you know, you may be able to just work with insulated water bottles and, and drink them quickly, but it, it is a strategy to try to eat and drink. And then the food was, um, you know, I pre-made and I handmade a lot of my food. We had uh, food drops, two food drops that were five pounds each that we had to send a couple of weeks ahead of time. Um, and they dropped by Bush Plain <laughs> at a certain location out in the Alaskan wilderness. And so I had, you know, also through Colin and Jay and I had talked about food and I, I made um, I made some little things. Everything was, uh, you know, I made some peanut butter, like, uh, peanut butter ball things. I made some little date bars and everything was cut into bite-sized pieces, put in Ziploc bags, um, and basically high calorie, high fat, th the most calories you could get for the least amount of weight and things that don't hold a lot of water content. So, you know, things like, you know, I really love, you know, the chewy goo chews and those kinds of things, but they have a lot of water content, so they're going to freeze. Um, so, if you're going to eat those kinds of things, there's basically, they have to be close to your body. So I also had a vest that Jay suggested and I made, and I had 
all these pockets in the vest. It was close to my body, my inside layer, and I had batteries in there to keep them warm. I had, if I wanted to eat something, I'd take it out of my frame bag, put it close to my body for a while in my sports bra or wherever or in one of these pockets to warm it up. And so you're using your body as a little bit of an insulator to unfreeze your food. But it takes planning. You know, if you if you want to eat something now, um, you have to think about it, you know, an hour before and put it in close to your body so that so that it won't freeze. So it just takes a lot more planning and a lot more discipline, which is really hard. That's awesome. I think some good good, good tips <laughs> the, there for sure. The upside down water bottle. I never would have thought about <clears throat> yeah, that. Yeah, it's a good idea because the top freezes first. Yeah. I guess that's just because there's less water sitting there, right? So it, it freezes first, I guess is the logic. With yeah, because it's a small little valve thing, you know, and so it'll freeze in there. And you can usually chew on that and warm it up with your mouth. But if you just spin it upside down, making sure you close the water bottle, um, right. then you'll have longer, you'll be able to drink right away from it. Okay. Um, and then for gravel, uh, I'm always just curious, tires are always the question. And uh, I'm just curious if you have sort of a, a, strat, a DK tire that you like to use or or just in general, like for this more long distance adventure, you just use Yeah, one. my go-to tire has been the Maxxis Rambler for a while, which S- is, Seems you know, to be common. It's a really great all-around tire. It's got enough tread for, you know, sketchy stuff, but... Um, nice and fast rolling on the smoother on the smoother thing so i've been using that tire for a while the biggest change i've made is and i think most people are doing this is i'm going wider and wider and wider and wider um so you know 40 or what's wide yeah i mean i used to run 38s now I, I ran 40 in arkansas i might run they have 45s now um and so it kind of if it's real chunky i w- i will ride 45s so it's just smoothing out the ride. I mean, you're asking a rigid bike to go over bumpy terrain. And so I am feeling like, um, wider tires, wider rims, you know, wider MV rims. That's where people are going even wider handlebars. Um, and it's, it's really cool to watch the progression of the equipment and, you know, just having a wider tire and more air underneath you is going to smooth out the ride. And in the end, especially for something ultra long, that's going to be more comfort on your body. Um, you're going to roll over things a little bit better. And so there's this sort of old roadie mentality. And even in mountain biking, that thinner tires are faster and it's just not the case. Um, you know, there I've done rolling resistant tests and things like that. And, and even if there is a slight, you know, rolling resistance, um, deficit, what you're making up for in comfort in your body and how you can, how the bike handles, you know, you're riding faster over technical stuff because you've got more security, you know, underneath the wheels and the tires. Awesome. And same sort of tire setup for this longer, uh, one you just did. Yeah, I was on, actually I ran 38s, um, the Maxxis Rambler 38s. And that was because the ride I just did in Arkansas, it was, it was 50% road and 50% gravel or 50% pavement, 50% gravel. And so I chose a little bit thinner just for those long roadie sections, you know, to have just a little bit narrower. And, and I also didn't know the nature of the gravel that I was going, going to come across. And a lot of it was pretty chunky. (laughs) And I mean, it was good. I, I was happy with my tire choice. Um, the other thing I've gone to in gravel is is not running, you know, the thinnest sidewall. Um, running, it's it's worth the extra weight to have a little bit thicker sidewall, a little bit thicker rubber, um, because you are in you're in gravel, and so there's just chunks of shale, and you know, easy to slice a sidewall in that kind of riding. Yeah, an extra thirty seconds due to weight beats like. 15 minutes trying to change changing a tire exactly <laughs> standing in the heat in, <laughs> in kansas yeah exactly um we could keep talking to you all day but i know you have a, a very busy schedule as per all of the things that you're doing so last thing is just yeah what's your what's your next adventure and how can everyone follow along with everything you're doing let's see next adventure so um DKXL, the 350, um, that is my next adventure um, ride. Um, I also have Rush Academy coming up in early June that I'm really excited about, and that's a four-day gravel camp in remote Idaho. There's still a few spots left in that. Um, and then another big event that I have coming up, um, it's in first two weeks of December, but I take a group back to the Ho Chi Minh Trail in Laos every year. Um, and it's part of the Be Good Foundation and part of me wanting to show 
an amazing part of the world. So I have spaces in Mountain Bike Lao, which is 10 days on the Ho Chi Minh Trail, um, and a, you know, a really life-changing expedition for people. And I take them on parts that of the trail that you've seen in the film and um, go through rem- remote villages that never see cars or rarely see people um, that don't live there. And so that expedition is open. It's, it's um, by application only. Um, and, you know, I'm planning more big bike expeditions and, and inspired one to show people Idaho and bring people here, but also um, take people to places like Laos and social media is just my name, Rebecca Rush. Um, and I don't know, there's another book in my head. There, there's all sorts of cool stuff happening. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm excited <laughs> if there's another book coming because I love oh, the first one. So thank you. thank you. Awesome. Well, we'll link to all of that, Rebecca, and thank you for your time for sure. And we'll, I'll try and keep, I know I have a few clients that have been down to private Idaho, so we'll make sure we get them oh, nice. all these links yeah, and stuff. Yeah, that's and... still open as well. Rebecca's private Idaho is Labor Day weekend. I forgot to talk about that. And what's fun about that is we've added... Everything from a 20-mile tater tot, 50-mile French fry, 100-mile baked potato, <laughs> and then the Queen's stage race is a three-day stage race. Um, so I kind of have added something for everybody for that event. So, um, you know, I want, I want everyone to be able to come no matter what distance they feel like tackling. Oh, that sounds awesome. amazing. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Rebecca. I'm glad we finally got to do this. <laughs> me too. <laughs> Thanks so much for talking to me. Thanks so much for tuning into the Consummate Athlete Podcast. Uh, You can check out my stuff over at theoutdooredit.com or by following me on Instagram and Twitter at Molly J. Herford. And you can check out Peter's coaching, training plans, blogs, all that fun stuff over at smartathlete.ca or by following him on Twitter and Instagram at Peter Glassford. And if you want to support this show and other awesome podcasts, please check out WideAnglePodium.com for show info, other podcasts, bonus content, and to become a donating member so you can get all of that rad behind-the-scenes content and help keep shows like this on the air. And lastly, if you're enjoying this podcast and all the information that we're bringing to you every single week... Uh, Do us a solid and pop into iTunes to leave us a rating and review. Takes you about two seconds. You can do it on your computer. You can do it on your phone. And it really helps us out. Thanks so much. And we will see you next week.